Welcome back, my friends. Tonight, I bring you the most famous tale written by one of the most famous authors, H.P. Lovecraft, The Call of Cthulhu. Please, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and hit that like button. Let's get on with the show. The Older Matters, which had made the sculptor's dream and base relief so significant to my uncle, formed the subject of the second half of his long manuscript. Once before, it appears Professor Angel had seen the hellish outlines of the nameless monstrosity, puzzled over the unknown hieroglyphics, and heard the ominous syllables which can be rendered only as Cthulhu. And all this and so stirring a horrible connection that is small wonder he pursued young Wilcox with queries and demands for data. This earlier experience had come in 1908, 17 years before, when the American Archaeological Society held its annual meeting in St. Louis. Professor Angel, as befitted one of his authority and attainments, had had a prominent part in all the deliberations and was one of the first to be approached by the several outsiders who took advantage of the convocation to offer questions for correct answering and problems for expert solution. The chief of these outsiders, and in a short time the focus of interest for the entire meeting, was a commonplace looking middle-aged man who had traveled all the way from New Orleans for certain special information unobtainable from any local source. His name was John Raymond Lagrassi, and he was by profession an inspector of police. With him, he bore the subject of his visit, a grotesque, repulsive, and apparently very ancient stone statuette whose origin he was at a loss to determine. It must not be fancied that Inspector Lagrassi had the least interest in archaeology. On the contrary, his wish for enlightenment was prompted by purely professional considerations. The statuette, idol, fetish, or whatever it was, had been captured some months before in the wooden swamps south of New Orleans during a raid on a supposed voodoo meeting. And so singular and hideous were the rites connected with it that the police could not but realize that they had stumbled on a dark cult totally unknown to them and infinitely more diabolical than even the blackest of the African voodoo circles. Of its origin, apart from the erratic and unbelievable tales extorted from the captured members, absolutely nothing was to be discovered. Hence the anxiety of the police for any antiquarian lore which might help them to place the frightful symbol, and through it track down the cult to its fountainhead. Inspector Lagrassi was scarcely prepared for the sensation which his offering created. One sight of the thing had been enough to throw the assembled men of science into a state of tense excitement, and they lost no time in crowding around him to gaze at the diminutive figure whose utter strangeness and air of a genuinely abysmal antiquity hinted so potently at unopened and archaic vistas. No recognized school of sculpture had animated this terrible object, yet centuries and even thousands of years seemed recorded in its dim and greenish surface of unplaceable stone. The figure, which was finally passed slowly from man to man for close and careful study, was between seven and eight inches in height, and of exquisitely artistic workmanship. It represented a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head, whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings behind. This thing, which seemed instinct with a fearsome and unnatural malignancy, was of a somewhat bloated corpulence, and squatted evilly on a rectangular block, pedestal covered with undecipherable characters. The tips of the wings touched the back edge of the block. The seat occupied the center, whilst the long, curved claws of the doubled-up, crouching hind legs gripped the front. 
and extended a quarter of the way down towards the bottom of the pedestal. The cephalopod head was bent forward so that the ends of the facial feelers brushed the backs of huge forepaws which clasped the croucher's elevated knees. The aspect of the whole was abnormally lifelike and the more subtle fearful because its source was so totally unknown. Its vast, awesome, and incalculable age was unmistakable, yet not one link did it show with any known type of art belonging to civilization's youth, or indeed to any other time. Totally separate and apart, its very material was a mystery, for the soapy, greenish black stone with its golden or iridescent flecks and citrations resembled nothing familiar to geology or mineralology. The characters along the base were equally baffling, and no member present, despite a representation of half the world's expert learning in this field, could form the least notion of even their remotest linguistic kinship. They, like the subject and material, belong to something horribly remote and distinct from mankind as we know it, something frightfully suggestive of old and unhallowed cycles of life in which our world and our conceptions have no part taking in. And yet, as the members severely shook their heads and confessed defeat at the inspector's problem, there was one man in that gathering who suspected a touch of bizarre familiarity in the monstrous shape and writing, and who presently told with some diffidence of the odd trifle that he knew. This person was the late William Channing Webb, professor of anthropology in Princeton University, and an explorer of no slight note. Professor Webb had been engaged 48 years before in a tour of Greenland and Iceland in search of some runic inscriptions which he failed to unearth, and whilst high up on the West Greenland coast had encountered a singular tribe or cult of degenerate Eskimos whose religion, a curious form of devil worship, chilled him with its deliberate bloodthirstiness and repulsiveness. It was a faith of which other Eskimos knew little, and which they mentioned only with shudders, saying that it come down from horribly ancient aeons before ever the world was made. Besides nameless rites and human sacrifices, there were certain queer hereditary rituals addressed to a supreme elder devil, or Tornasuk, and of this Professor Webb had taken a careful phonetic copy from an aged Anjakok, or wizard priest, expressing the sounds in Roman letters as best he knew how. But just now of prime significance was the fetish which this cult had cherished, and around which they danced when the aurora leaped high over the ice cliffs. It was the Professor as stated, a very crude base relief of stone, comprising a hideous picture and some cryptic writing, and as far as he could tell, it was a rough parallel in all essential features of the bestial thing now lying before the meeting. These data, received with suspense and astonishment by the assembled members, proved doubly exciting to Inspector Lagrassi, and he began at once to ply his informant with questions. Having noted and copied an oral ritual among the swamp cult worshippers his men had arrested, he besought the professor to remember as best he might the syllables taken down amongst the diabolist Eskimos. There then followed an exhaustive comparison of details, and a moment of really awed silence when both detective and scientist agreed on the virtual identity of the phrase common to two hellish rituals so many worlds of distance apart. What in substance both the Eskimo wizards and the Louisiana swamp priests had chanted to their kindred idols was something very like this. The word divisions being guessed at from traditional breaks in the phrase as chanted aloud. Fine Gluai, Migla Naf, Cthulhu, Rale, Wagha Nagi, Fitag. The Grassi had one point in advance of Professor Webb for several among his mongrel prisoners had repeated to him what older celebrants had told them the words meant. This text, as given, ran something like this. In his house at Raleigh, dead Cthulhu waits, dreaming. 
And now, in response to a general and urgent demand, Inspector Lagrassi related as fully as possible his experience with the swamp worshippers, telling a story to which I could see my uncle attach profound significance. It savored of the wildest dreams of mythmaker and theosophist, and disclosed an astonishing degree of cosmic imagination among such half-castes and pariahs as might be least expected to possess it. On November the 1st, 1907, there had come to New Orleans police of frantic summons from the swamp and lagoon country to the south. The squatters there, mostly primitive but good-natured descendants of Lafitte's men, were in the grip of stark terror from an unknown thing which had stolen upon them in the night. It was voodoo, apparently, but voodoo of a more terrible sort than they had ever known, and some of their women and children had disappeared since the malevolent Tom Tom had begun its incessant beating far within the black haunted woods where no dweller ventured. There were insane shouts and harrowing screams, soul-chilling chants and dancing devil flames, and the frightened messenger added that people could stand it no more. So a body of twenty police, filling two carriages and an automobile, had set out in the late afternoon with the shivering squatter as a guide. At the end of the passable road they alighted, and four miles splashed on in silence through the terrible cypress woods where day never came. Ugly roots and malignant hanging nooses of Spanish moss beset them, and now and then a pile of dank stones or fragments of a rotting wall intensified by its hint of morbid habitation. A depression which every malformed tree and every fungus islet combined to create. At length the squatter settlement, a miserable huddle of huts, of in sight, and hysterical dwellers ran out to cluster around the group of bobbing lanterns. The muffled beat of tom-toms was now faintly audible far, far ahead, and a curdling shriek came at infrequent intervals when the wind shifted. A reddish glare, too, seemed to filter through the pale undergrowth beyond endless avenues of forest and night. Reluctant even to be left alone again, each one of the cowled squatters refused point-blank to advance another inch towards the scene of unholy worship, so Inspector Lagrassi and his nineteen colleagues plunged on, unguided into black orchids, a horror that none of them had ever trod before. The region, now entered by the police, was one of traditionally evil repute, substantially unknown and untraversed by white men. There was legends of a hidden lake, unglimpsed by mortal sight in which dwelt a huge, formless white polypus thing with luminous eyes, and squatters whispered that bat-winged devils flew up out of caverns and inner earth to worship it at night. They said it had been there before de Beverville, before La Salle, before the Indians, and before even the wholesome beasts and birds of the woods. It was nightmare itself, and to see it was to die but it made men dream, and so they knew enough to keep away. The present voodoo orgy was, indeed, on the merest fringe of this abhorred area, but that location was bad enough, hence perhaps the very place of the worship had terrified the squatters more than the shocking sounds and incidents. Only poetry or madness could do justice to the noises heard by Lagrassi's men as they plowed on through the black morass towards the red glare and the muffled tom-toms. There are vocal qualities peculiar to men, and vocal qualities peculiar to beasts, and it is terrible to hear the one when the source should yield the other. Animal fury and orgiastic license here whipped themselves to demoniac heights by howls and squawking ecstasies that tore and reverberated through those nighted woods like pestilential tempests from the gulfs of hell. Now and then the less organized alluluations would cease, and from what seemed a well-drilled chorus of hoarse voices would rise and sing-song chant a hideous phrase or ritual. Fingui, Miglu na, Cthulhu rala, Waga na gli, Fingtung. Then the men, having reached a spot where the trees were thinner, came suddenly in sight of the spectacle itself. Four of them reeled, 
one fainted and two were shaken into a frantic cry, which the mad cacophony of the orgy fortunately deadened. Legrassi dashed swamp water on the face of the fainting man, and all stood trembling and nearly hypnotized with horror. In a natural glade of the swamp stood a grassy island of perhaps an acre's extent, clear of trees and tolerable dry. On this now leaped and twisted a more indescribable horde of human abnormality than any but a semi or an angarola could paint. Void of clothing, this hybrid spawn were braying, bellowing and writhing about a monstrous, ring-shaped bonfire, in the center of which, revealed by occasional rifts in the curtain of flame, stood a great granite monolith, some eight feet in height, on top of which, incongruous in its diminutiveness, rested the noxious cavern statuette. From a wide circle of ten scaffolds, set up at regular intervals, with the flame-girt monolith, as a center hung, head downward, the oddly marred bodies of the helpless squatters who had disappeared. It was inside this circle that the ring of worshippers jumped and roared. General direction of the mass motion being from the left to right, an endless bacchanal between the ring of bodies and the ring of fire. It may have been only imagination, and it may have been only echoes which induced one of the men an excitable Spaniard to fancy he heard antiphonal responses to the ritual from some far and unilluminated spot, deeper within the wood of ancient legendary and horror. This man, Joseph D. Galvez, I later met and questioned, and he proved distractingly imaginative. He indeed went so far as to hint off the faint beating of great wings, and of a glimpse of shining eyes and a mountainous white bulk beyond the remotest trees, but I suppose he had been hearing too much native superstition. Actually, the horrified pause of the men was of comparatively brief duration. Duty came first, and although there must have been nearly a hundred mongrel celebrants in the throng, the police relied on their firearms and plunged determinately into the nauseous route. For five minutes, the resultant din and chaos were beyond description. Wild blows were struck, shots were fired, and escapes were made. But in the end, Legrassi was able to count some 47 sullen prisoners, whom he forced to dress in haste and fall in line between two rows of policemen. Five of the worshippers lay dead, and two severely wounded ones were carried away on improvised stretchers by their fellow prisoners. The image on the monolith, of course, was carefully removed and carried back by La Grassi. Examined at headquarters after a trip of intense strain and weariness, the prisoners all proved to be men of a very low, mixed-blooded and mentally aberrant type. Most were seamen, and a sprinkling of negroes and mulattoes, largely West Indians or Bravo Portuguese from the Cape Verde Islands, gave a coloring of Buddhism to the erroneous cult, but before many questions were asked, it became manifest that something far deeper and older than Negro fetishism was involved. Degraded and ignorant as they were, the creatures held with surprising consistency to the central idea of their loathsome faith. They worshipped, so they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men, and who came to the young world out of the sky. These old ones were gone now, inside the earth and under the sea, but their dead bodies had told their secrets and dreams to the first men, who formed a cult which had never died. This was that cult, and the prisoners said it had always existed and always would exist, hidden in distant wastes and dark places, all over the world until the time when the great priest Cthulhu, from his dark house in the mighty city of Riley, under the waters, should rise and bring the earth again beneath his sway. Some day he would call, when the stars were ready, and the secret cult would always be waiting to liberate him. Meanwhile, no more must be told. There was a secret which even torture could not extract. Mankind was not absolutely alone among the conscious things of earth. 
for shapes came out of the dark to visit the faithful few. But these were not the great old ones. No man had ever seen the old ones. The carven idol was great Cthulhu, but none might say whether or not the others were precisely like him. No one could read the old writing now, but things were told by word of mouth. The chanted ritual was not the secret. That was never spoken aloud, only whispered. The chant meant only this. In his house at Riley, dead Cthulhu waits, dreaming. Only two of the prisoners were found sane enough to be hanged, and the rest were committed to various institutions. All denied a part in the ritual murders, and averred that the killing had been done by black-winged ones, which had come to them from their immemorial meeting place in the haunted wood. But of those mysterious allies, no coherent account could ever be gained. What the police did extract came mainly from an immensely aged mestizo named Castro, who claimed to have sailed to strange ports and talked with undying leaders of the cult in the mountains of China. Old Castro remembered bits of hideous legend that paled the speculations of theosophists and made man and the world seem recent and transient indeed. There had been aeons when other things ruled over the earth, and they had had great cities. Remains of them, he said, the deathless Chinaman had told him, were still to be found as cyclopean stones on islands in the Pacific. They all died vast epochs of time before men came, but there were arts which could revive them when the stars had come round again to the right positions in the cycle of eternity. They had indeed come themselves from the stars, and brought their images with them. These great old ones, Castro continued, were not composed altogether of flesh and blood. They had shape, for did not this star-fashioned image prove it? But that shape was not made of matter. When the stars were right, they could plunge from world to world through the sky. But when the stars were wrong, they could not live. But although they no longer lived, they would never really die. They all lay in stone houses in their great city of Riley, preserved by the spells of mighty Cthulhu, for a glorious resurrection when the stars and the earth might once more be ready for them. But at that time, some force from outside must serve to liberate their bodies. The spells that preserved them intact likewise prevented them from making an initial move and they could only lie awake in the dark and think whilst uncounted millions of years rolled by. They knew all that was occurring in the universe, for their mode of speech was transmitted thought. Even now, they talked in their tombs, when after infinities of chaos the first men came. The great old ones spoke to the sensitive among them by molding their dreams, for only thus could their language reach the fleshy minds of mammals. Then, whispered Castro, those first men formed the cult around small idols, which the Great Ones showed them. Idols brought in dim arrows from dark stars. That cult would never die till the stars came right again, and the secret priests would take Great Cthulhu from his tomb to revive his subjects and resume his rule of Earth. The time would be easy to know, for then mankind would have to become as the Great Old Ones free and wild and beyond good and evil, with laws and morals thrown aside, and all men shouting and killing, reveling in joy. Then the liberated old ones would teach them new ways to shout and kill and revel and enjoy themselves, and all the earth would flame with a holocaust of ecstasy and freedom. Meanwhile, the cult by appropriate rites must keep alive the memory of those ancient ways and shadow forth the prophecy of their return. In the elder time, chosen men had talked with the entombed old ones in dreams, but then something had happened. The great stone city Riley, with its monoliths and sulfurs, had sunk beneath the waves, and the deep waters, full of the one primal mystery through which not even thought can pass, had cut off the spectral intercourse. But memory never died, and high priests said that the city would rise again when the stars were right. 
Then came out of the earth the black spirits of earth, moldy and shadowy, and full of dim rumors picked up in caverns beneath forgotten sea bottoms. But of them old Castro dared not speak much. He cut himself off hurriedly, and no amount of persuasion or subtlety could elicit more in this direction. The size of the old ones, too, he curiously declined to mention. Of the cult, he said that he thought the center lay amid the pathless deserts of Arabia, where Irem, the city of pillars, dreams hidden and untouched. It was not allied to the European witch cult, and was virtually unknown beyond its members. No book had ever really hinted of it, though the deathless Chinamen said that there were double meanings in the Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul Azarid, which the initial might read as they chose, especially the much discussed couplet. That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons even death may die. The Grassi deeply impressed, and not a little bewildered, had inquired in vain concerning the historic affiliations of the cult. Castro, apparently, had told the truth when he said that it was wholly secret. The authorities at Tulane University could shed no light upon either cult or image, and now the detective had come to the highest authorities in the country and met with no more than the Greenland tale of Professor Webb. The feverish interest aroused at the meeting by La Grassi's tale, corroborated as it was by the statuette, is echoed in the subsequent correspondence of those who attended. Although scant mention occurs in the formal publication of the society, caution is the first case of those accustomed to face occasional charlatanry and imposture. La Grassi for some time lent the image to Professor Webb, but at the latter's death it was returned to him and remains in his possession, where I viewed it not long ago. It is truly a terrible thing, and unmistakably akin to the dream sculpture of young Wilcox. That my uncle was excited by the tale of the sculptor I did not wonder, for what thoughts must arise upon hearing, after a knowledge of what Le Grassi had learned of the cult of a sensitive young man, who had dreamed not only the figure and exact hieroglyphics of the swamp-bound image and the Greenland Devil Tablet, but had come in his dreams upon at least three of the precise words of the formula uttered alike by Eskimo Diabolists and Mongrel Louisianans. Professor Angel's instant start on an investigation of the utmost thoroughness was eminently natural, though privately I suspected young Wilcox of having heard of the cult in some indirect way, and having invented a series of dreams to heighten and continue the mystery at my uncle's expense. The dream narratives and cuttings collected by the professor were, of course, strong corroboration, but the rationalism of my mind and the extravagance of the whole subject led me to adopt what I thought the most sensible conclusions. So after thoroughly studying the manuscript again and correlating the theosophical and anthropological notes with the cult narrative of the Grassi, I made a trip to Providence to see the sculptor and give him the rebuke I thought proper for so boldly imposing upon learned and aged man. Wilcox still lived alone in the Flore de Lise building in Thomas Street, a hideous Victorian imitation of 17th century Breton architecture which flaunts its stuccoed front amidst the lovely colonial houses on the ancient hill, and under the very shadow of the finest Georgian steeple in America. I found him at work in his rooms, and at once conceded from the specimens scattered about that his genius is indeed profound and authentic. He will, I believe, be heard for from some time as one of the great decadents, for he has crystallized in clay and will one day mirror in marble those nightmares and fantasies which Arthur McKinn evokes in prose and Clark Ashton Smith makes visible in verse and in painting. Dark, frail, and somewhat unkempt in aspect, he turned languidly at my knock and asked me my business without rising. When I told him who I was, he displayed some interest, for my uncle had excited his curiosity in probing his strange dreams, yet had never explained the reason for the study. I did not enlarge his knowledge in this regard, but sought with some subtlety to draw him out. In a short time, 
I became convinced of his absolute sincerity, for he spoke of the dreams in a manner none else could. They and their subconscious residue had influenced his art profoundly, and he showed me a morbid statue whose contours almost made me shake with the potency of its black suggestion. He could not recall having seen the original of this thing except in his own dream base relief, but the outlines had formed themselves insensibly under his hands. It was, no doubt, the giant shape he had raved of in delirium, that he really knew nothing of the hidden cult, save from what my uncle's relentless catchism had let fall. He soon made clear, and again I strove to think of some way in which he could possibly have received the weird impressions. He talked of his dreams in a strangely poetic fashion, making me see with terrible vividness the damp cyclopean city of slimy green stone, whose geometry, he oddly said, was all wrong, and here with frightened expectancy, the ceaseless, half-mental calling from underground, Cthulhu Fatung, Cthulhu Fatung. These words had formed part of that dread ritual which told of dead Cthulhu's dream vigil in his stone vault at Riley, and I felt deeply moved despite my rational beliefs. Wilcox, I was sure, had heard of the cult in some casual way, and had soon forgotten it amidst the mass of his equally weird reading and imagining. Later, by virtue of its sheer impressiveness, it had found subconscious expression in dreams, in the base relief, and in the terrible statue I now beheld, so that his imposture upon my uncle had been a very innocent one. The youth was of a type, at once slightly affected and slightly ill-mannered, which I could never like, but I was willing enough now to admit both his genius and his honesty. I took leave of him amicably, and wished him all the success his talent promises. The matter of the cult still remained to fascinate me, and at times I had visions of personal fame from researches into its origins and connections. I visited New Orleans, talked with Agrassi and others of that old-time raiding party, saw the frightful image and even questioned such of the mongrel prisoners as still survived. Old Castro, unfortunately, had been dead for some years. What I now heard so graphically at first hand though it was really no more than a detailed confirmation of what my uncle had written, excited me afresh, for I felt sure that I was on the track of a very real, very secret, and very ancient religion whose discovery would make me an anthropologist of note. My attitude was still one of absolute materialism, as I wish it still were, and I discounted with a most inexplicable, perversely, the coincidence of the dream notes, and odd cuttings collected by Professor Angel. One thing which I began to suspect, and which I now fear I know, is that my uncle's death was far from natural. He fell on a narrow hill street leading up from an ancient waterfront swarming with foreign mongrels. After a careless push from a negro sailor, I did not forget the mixed blood and marine pursuits of the cult members in Louisiana, and would not be surprised to learn of secret methods and poison needles as ruthless and as anciently known as the cryptic rites and beliefs. Legrassi and his men, it is true, have been let alone. But in Norway, a certain seaman who saw things is dead. Might not the deeper inquiries of my uncle after encountering the sculptor's data have come to sinister ears? I think Professor Angel died because he knew too much, or because he was likely to learn too much. Whether I shall go as he did remains to be seen for I have learned much now.